Church family, there we go. It's good to see you today. Glad that you have joined us for worship. Hope you're doing well. If you're a guest with us today, um, like we hope you don't feel like a guest. We hope you feel welcomed here because you are welcomed here. It means a lot to us that God has drawn you to worship with us this morning. My name is Ryan Flint. I currently serve as the discipleship pastor here at First NSB, which means the the main responsibility I have is I oversee our groups ministry. But from time to time. I get the opportunity to step on this platform and step behind this podium and share the Word of God with our church family on a Sunday morning, and today happens to be one of those times. So this morning, as you can probably tell from that sermon bumper, we are starting, even though it's the middle of February, our Easter sermon series. Easter's early this year, but we're going to go ahead and get a jump start on it. Our series is titled, Suffering Servant, Exalted Savior. Over the next six weeks, uh, myself and Pastor Luke, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 22, 23, and 24. And today we start by looking at Luke 22, verses 1 to 23. I want to pray for us, and then we'll get to work. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are incredibly grateful to be in your house this morning. Lord, I pray that as we, we have proclaimed the truths of Scripture and the truths of your character and your nature through song this morning, I pray that we will also be attentive, be receptive to the work of your Holy Spirit as we open your word. God, I pray you speak through me to bring comfort, to bring conviction. Lord, that you would use me as a vessel to bring us closer to you. Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, I did the announcements for the 1030 worship gathering, and I opened those announcements by polling the crowd to see who we were cheering for in the Super Bowl. So some folks were cheering for the Chiefs. Some were cheering for the 49ers. The vast majority of you couldn't care less. Like, you did not care. At the time I made that announcement, I had no plans for the Super Bowl. Uh, My wife was going to, she was hanging out with some friends of hers here from church. They were going out of town. So it was just going to be me and my boys. And I was perfectly content with just sitting at the house and watching the game on my couch. By the time I left church last week, my oldest son had informed me that he had invited us to Luke McKinney's house to watch the Super Bowl, which is like the third time I think that's happened, where he's extended the invitation to someone else's house. I was like, that's not, that's not how we do that, but okay. So I talked to Luke before we left, and I texted him, and he said, yeah, man, you're always welcome. They're super hospitable, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for Luke and his family. And I tell him, all right, well, I'll, I'll bring my boys, and I'll bring some sausage dip. I kind of like, well, I was going to make it for myself, but I guess I'll share. And it's a killer dip. I'm not going to lie. I make a killer sausage dip. And I will need to clarify that when I say I make, what I mean is my wife puts four ingredients into a crock pot. I put one ingredient in a crock pot, and I turn the crock pot on, and it's great. So I take the crock, I take my dip, I get my boys, and we're heading to Luke's. And in route, I'm kind of going over the ground rules, like, hey, man, we're leaving at halftime. Okay, I'm not staying for this whole game, number one, because I don't really care about the halftime show. I'm not trying to disparage Usher or his performance. I just don't care. And two, you have school tomorrow, and I'm not going to wrestle you on a Monday morning to go to school because I have kept you out late and up late to watch this game. Are we good? We're leaving at halftime. I don't want to hear you whining, complaining. No, we're leaving at halftime. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. We're on the same page. We're good. So we get to Luke's house. I set my dip up, and I, I go, and I sit to watch the Super Bowl. And what I mean when I say I watch the Super Bowl is I repeatedly remind my seven-year-old son to quit yelling at the Super Bowl. He screamed so loud at this game for the two quarters we were there. It was a problem. Like, I have never, I thought he had money on the game. Like, I was like, why, 
why are you, they can't hear you, dude. Like, stop screaming. He's a Patrick Mahomes fan. He wore his little jersey. Our oldest son could have, uh, he's not a football fan. He doesn't care, and that's perfectly fine. But my youngest was, like, super invested to where multiple times I had, there, I mean, you could ask the McKinney's, they were there. Hey, back up, hush, sit down, man. Like, it just let's just enjoy the game. So inevitably, two quarters go by, and it's halftime. And as a man of my word, I go to my boys and go, hey, let's wrap it up. Like, we're out. We're leaving. So I go grab my empty crock pot because I told you it was killer. Everybody ate it. It was good. I get my boys, and we get home. My wife's still not home yet, and uh, I get the boys ready for bed. They get showers. We do a little family devotion together. We pray, and then I put them to bed. And then I get to enjoy the second half of the Super Bowl by myself on my couch. And it was delightful. Like, I really enjoyed it. it was, not only was it just not, it was like, it was a really good game. It was really competitive, and it was really, like, it was really entertaining as just a football fan myself. And I remember, like, my team is nowhere close to the Super Bowl, so I'm really not invested in the game. But because it was so entertaining and because it was so competitive, like, I found myself last Sunday night actually, like, physically leaning towards the TV in the waning moments of the game. So you've got the, the 49ers that have gone up late in the fourth quarter, and you've got Patrick Mahomes, who's now got the ball with under two minutes, driving the length of the field. What's going to happen? This is incredible. Like, what a, this is history-making for those of us that care about football. Obviously, those that don't, bear with me. Okay, we're getting through it. <laughs> then 16 seconds to go in the fourth quarter comes, and this is, I mean, I'm like, hey, this is the end of the season. This is the culmination of this game. This is, the, th- this is it. Like, this is the end. This is the finale of this, the two best teams, the two greatest, and then like, the, in the greatest game. This is an incredible scene, and with 16 seconds left to go, my cable cuts out. <laughs> <laughs> and I started yelling at my TV like a seven-year-old. Like, I was, so, what are we doing? Like, Spectrum now? Are you serious? Like, not with 16 seconds? Like, not... I just stared. I actually, I should have posted it. Like, I put it on social media. I was like, Spectrum, we have a problem. Like, this is an issue. Not now. Not on, like, the, the precipice of the end. Like, the culmination of the game, the season. What's going to happen? Like, are the 49ers going to get a stop? Is Patrick Mahomes going to put him in field goal range and go kick a Super Bowl for, or go kick a field goal for uh, overtime? Is he going to throw a touchdown pass to Travis Kelsey? Probably. And above all that, what does Taylor Swift have to do with it? Like, <laughs> what are we missing here? Like, I'm missing this, and it was like, Probably a minute went by, and I'm just staring at my TV. It just says buffering on it, and I'm so mad. And I'm just sitting, and I'm sitting, and I'm sitting, and I'm sitting, and eventually the game picks back up. I catch the kick at the end to send them into overtime, and then I watch the end of, a, again, a really entertaining game. While the feelings aren't the same, if you want to be very clear, feelings are not the same, it was that chain of events that come to mind when I started putting the sermon together for this week. And at first, I was like, that's kind of an odd intro. I'm not really sure how that connects with Luke 22, 1 to 23. And the more I sat with it, the more I, the more I kind of saw it, and I hope you see it too. I just mentioned for the next six weeks, we're studying the last three chapters of Luke's gospel in preparation for Easter. And the argument could be made, and it's a pretty strong argument, that these last three chapters... This is the climax of Luke's entire story. It's the culmination of all of the historical records, of all of the the eyewitness accounts, of all the data that he has collected that that leads up to and culminates in these final three chapters. And it's not like we've been studying the book of Luke that's led us to this point. We're picking up right at the end, metaphorically speaking, with about 16 seconds to go in the fourth quarter. So what's happened? What's gone on that's led us to this point? What's going on now? And then what's going to take place next? So that's where I'd like to go with our time together. We're going we're gonna to give a little bit of background as to where we pick up in Luke's gospel. We're going to talk a little bit about what Jesus is doing with his disciples and why he's doing it with them. And then we're actually going to wrap up this morning by partaking and observing the same thing that Jesus and his disciples are partaking in in this text. Because what we read here is the first account of it actually happening. Communion. If you remember from our Christmas story series, which of course you do. We picked up in the book of Luke, and Luke was writing his gospel account to a single individual, the man named Theophilus. What we're reading here is a letter. Luke is a doctor. He's highly educated, and he's worked really, really, really hard to gather together all of the evidence, the the eyewitness accounts, all of these details to put together a story to present to Theophilus to verify 
the life of this man, Jesus, and, and who Jesus is, that it's actually something Theophilus had already been taught. The breakdown of Luke's gospel includes the first two chapters being titled the, the Infancy Narrative. This is according to the ESV Study Bible breakdown. The Infancy Narrative in chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 3 through a part of chapter 4 is the preparation for Jesus' ministry. The middle of 4 to the middle of chapter 9 is his ministry in Galilee, his, his healings, his miracles, his teachings, his, his deliverance. Then we go from the, the part, uh, middle of 9 through the middle of chapter 19, and that chronicle, Luke chronicles here Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. And then beginning in 19 through 20, and as we pick up in 22, it is Jesus with his disciples in Jerusalem. These events that we'll read over the next couple of weeks fall on what church history has traditionally called Holy Week. So that we're looking at the last few days of Jesus' life. And before we get to the text, which I promise you we're going to do this morning, I've really wrestled with this, not wrestled in a bad way, but just in a, just in a genuine way, because there's a fine line that, that all pastors have to walk on a lot of things, but with this one in particular, like what do you do when you come to a text and you, you explain it or you teach it, and potentially half or more of your congregation knows or understands or has kind of done it before, and then the other half might go, or, or less than half goes, I don't even know what this is. I don't even know why he gave me this this morning. Like how do you balance between the two? How do you make sure that both in some capacity, by the Spirit of God, ultimately, are fed? Because what we're going to talk about today fits that description. And I want to spend a few minutes, maybe just two, like guarding you against what I think is, has probably already happened in some of your hearts and minds this morning. If you walked in here this morning, and I'm not trying to be disparaging or throw guilt and shame on anybody, I'm just this is a, a genuine response that could have occurred this morning. If you walked in here this morning and you went, oh, we're doing this again? Didn't we do this the other week? Oh, I, I know what he's going to talk about. I know what he's, oh, I've heard this before. If that's how you've entered into the room, I'm glad you're in the room but what you have to fight against is the spiritual warfare of going, this is just another thing. And what's going to happen over the next 20 to 30 minutes is if you believe that and you embrace that intentionally or unintentionally, I strongly believe that you will diminish, not eliminate, but diminish the possibility of God speaking to you in a real powerful way this morning. And whether you're a member, whether you're a guest, whether you're a regular attender, it does not matter. I don't want you to miss it. So that's some spiritual warfare that's on you today that you're going to have to fight against over the next half an hour. But the same is true on the other side of the spectrum where you could walk in here and you could look and you could be given the elements and go, I don't, I don't know, it's like some juice and bread to me. I'm just here. I don't even know, I don't even know what he's talking about and I don't know how it applies to me. So pastor, just be glad I'm in the room. And again, I am. I'm incredibly grateful that you're in the room. But if you, if you check out mentally, like you're here, but you're not here, you too will diminish the possibility, not eliminate, but diminish the possibility of the Spirit of God speaking to you in a real powerful way this morning. And whether you're a member, whether you're a guest, whether you're a regular attender, I love you and I don't want you to miss it. And that is an active way that you participate in the sermon this morning, is by recognizing that this is present and I've got to fight against it over the next half an hour or so. My prayer is that as we discuss this morning, or the things that we discuss this morning, will fall fresh on all of us today. And that we see what happens in this text and what we will practice and observe as a church family later this morning as sweeter than we ever have before. With all that said, let's get to work. Luke 22, we're going to pick up in verse 1 going to read 1 to 13. We'll come back and talk about it for a little bit, and then we'll pick up 14 to 23 after a while. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover, 
And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money, so he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. There are a few minor things worth mentioning here before we actually get to like the, the crux of these first 13 verses. First, I want you to notice the motivation that led the chief priests and scribes to plot to kill Jesus. They feared the people. They undoubtedly must have asked questions like, well, what will they think? Or what will they say? Or what will they do? Or how will they respond? Or how will they react? These are all questions ultimately rooted in a fear of man. And they are all questions that you and I still wrestle with today. And if you're not careful, and you possess a fear of man over and above a fear of God, that fear of man will lead you to do some, to be quite blunt, pretty ridiculous things because you will be more concerned with the thoughts and opinions of those around you than of Almighty God. Then Luke gives us this kind of like behind the scenes shot of what happens as Judas goes to betray Jesus. And the testimony of Judas should cause, should lead us as like a, should serve as like a cautionary tale. That, being, that you can be so close to Jesus and yet be so far from him. And Judas spent time with him. He ate with him. He saw him do ministry. He heard his teachings. He witnessed the miraculous. He, he possessed all of the external evidence that would lead one to believe that him and Jesus were like really close. But further study of the word of God would indicate that Judas, unlike the other disciples, never once references Jesus as Lord, only rabbi. He only recognized Jesus as a teacher, never the Messiah. And the lesson here is that someone can give off all of the external signs as to what it looks like to follow Jesus. They could attend the worship gatherings. They could go to the Bible study. They could serve in one area or another. But it also be true that they have never recognized Jesus as Lord and Savior internally. And I think this is why we see Judas, Judas do what Judas does here and, and betrays Jesus for some chump change. He was around him, but he didn't know him. And I don't, I don't say any of that to like like intentionally cause unnecessary fear or lead someone to unnecessarily doubt their own salvation. But Jesus himself is quite clear, and we have to wrestle with this in Matthew 7. Then the last days, there are going to be a bunch of folks that go to Jesus and go, look at all that we did for you. We did this in your name, and we did that in your name, and we did this in your name. And the response of Jesus is going to be, I never knew you. External signs are but a part of one's faith in Jesus. But if one has never internally repented of their sins and put their faith in Christ, then the external signs are irrelevant. What matters is what you believe about who Jesus is. The last thing worth mentioning is the simple fact that Jesus tells John and Peter to do something. And they just do it. They just practice simple obedience. I think we lose sight of this too much. Jesus says, hey, hey, go here, talk to this person, get this set up. 
And Peter and John never go, oh, so I've, never, I've never been there. I'm, I'm probably not your guy. They never say, I, I don't know who you're talking about. I, I, don't, I don't know this individual, so I'm kind of nervous. I don't want to talk to him because I don't really know him. They never say, I've, I've, never, set up, I've never set up Passover. You should probably talk to somebody who, who knows what they're doing because I don't know what I'm doing. They never once offer hesitation, delay, or excuse. They just do what Jesus told them to do. And it's exactly how Jesus said it was going to happen. We too should respond to the commands of Christ with simple obedience. How often do we, how guilty am I, of responding to the commands of Jesus with hesitation or delay or excuse or it's not me, it, you need to talk to them. You need to go to that person. They know, they, like we give all of these answers instead of just doing what Jesus tells us to do. All of those events surround the larger event that's taking place here in these verses, and that is the recognition and the observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread at Passover. And in order to have a better understanding of like what is actually going on here in the text and what the disciples, Jesus and the disciples are doing, one needs to have a, a better understanding of like why they're doing it and, and what it actually is. And, and to do that, you need to understand a little bit of biblical history. So here we go. These are a group of Jewish men that along with other Jewish individuals at this time would partake in, again, what's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread to commemorate God's work in rescuing his people from Egyptian captivity. The story goes, and we find this in the first few chapters of the book of Exodus, God's people are enslaved by Pharaoh, who out of fear, a fear of man, decides to put the Israelites in captivity and oppress them because their numbers were growing so large and he was afraid that they would overthrow him. God chooses Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, and the manner in which God decides to do this is by sending ten plagues upon Egypt, ultimately leading to their freedom. In short, they are celebrating and remembering how God drew his people out of bondage to draw them closer to him in a more intimate relationship. And the last of these plagues, the, the plague that officially secured their freedom, was that that occurred or that were being done to the broken body and shed blood of a sacrificial lamb. Israelites were commanded to slaughter a lamb and to cover the doorposts of their home with its blood so that when the last plague occurred, the angel of death, who was coming to kill the firstborn within every home, that angel would see the blood on the door and would pass over those homes, thus saving the family. This is obviously a massive event in Jewish history and one that God's, the people of God were commanded to recognize every year during Passover through the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The reason for this tradition was that the people of God had to flee Egypt so quickly they were not able to put leaven or yeast in their bread to allow their bread to rise. They had to leave so quickly they just didn't have the time. So they had to keep this bread unleavened or not put yeast in it so that the bread would not rise so they could get out on time with food. We find this command explicitly in Deuteronomy 16, 3. This meal that they are gathered together to share is a reminder of God's goodness, grace, power, mercy, faithfulness, love, and desire to be with his people. So if you fast forward from, from Exodus, the first handful of chapters there, and you, you move forward to, to Luke 22, Jesus is about to partake and commemorate this meal with his disciples. But what he is going to do is to present them with an even greater picture of God's goodness, his grace, his mercy, his faithfulness, his love, and his desire to be with his people. Let's pick up in verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, 
I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man to whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who is going to do this. By using the Passover meal, Jesus is doing something. He's, he's communicating a particular truth. He's establishing what he even refers to as a new covenant. The, the old covenant is found in the Old Testament. It's built upon the law. But Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And in a fulfillment of the old covenant, he establishes a new covenant. A new covenant not built off the, the rules and rituals that you find in the Old Testament. One, but a new covenant built off of him and him alone. You see, while the Passover did remind the Israelites that God drew his people out of bondage to draw them closer to him, the, the broken body and shed blood of a sacrificial lamb. Jesus now uses this meal to teach his disciples around the table and to remind you and me today that God still draws his people out of bondage to draw them into a more intimate relationship with him. Through the broken body and shed blood of a, shac- of a sacrificial lamb. But that lamb is the lamb of God. The Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. He is referring to himself as the great sacrifice that will be needed for salvation to be made possible. Sin is the greatest bondage that you and I are bound by. We cannot escape it. We cannot overcome it. We cannot have victory over it. We cannot defeat it in and of itself. We are hopelessly lost without Jesus coming to serve us by suffering for us by taking our place, by dying on the cross and three days later being being raised from the grave. This is a glorious thing that we get to observe Jesus do and partake in as a church family. Though I haven't like officially confirmed this, I haven't counted this this week, maybe you've heard of this, The, the most repeated command in the Bible, is do not be afraid. It's it's found somewhere roughly around 365 times in Scripture. Do you know what the second most repeated command is? To remember. To remember. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, hey, I'd encourage you to. Hey, you might want to It's a command. He is adamantly saying, remember this. Why? Why is it the second most repeated command in Scripture? And why is it repeated so often? Because of how quickly we are prone to forget. Like how quickly we are prone to just naturally in and of ourselves just kind of like move on past it. Like, why do I have to tell my seven-year-old son so many times in the span of two football quarters to stop yelling at the television? Because he forgets. His, his brain moves on. Okay, sorry, Dad, I'm going to back up. And then the game is so great, I'm going to keep, like, nope, back up. Oh, sorry, Dad, I'm going to keep, no, nope, no, nope, it's, but it's a great, uh, yeah, the, the touchdown, yeah, what? No, nope, back up, son. He forgets. Why do I have to remind my oldest son to shut the door to the garage when he walks out. Happened this morning, actually. Like, hey, man, we actually want to keep that door shut. Y'all got, like, frogs and stuff around here that gets in our house? We're not a fan, all right? Like, I don't, keep it shut, dude. How many times? How many times has my wife had to tell me any number of things on a long list over and over and over again? Because how prone we are to forget. It just, like, slips our mind. We just move on to the next thing. It is true with us in our families. It is true with us in our work. It is true of us spiritually. 
One of my favorite songs, I think I've mentioned this before, one of my favorite songs in all of Christian music. It's an older song. It's Come Thou Fount. I love that song. In the second verse, we find some of the most authentic lines in Christian music history. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Like we have this natural propensity to just like drift, like just float away, to lose sight of how great and glorious and marvelous and amazing the gift of salvation truly is. That's why I opened this morning saying some of the things that I said, because so easily we could walk down the hall and we could grab the elements and go, all right, and we miss it. We need to be reminded, these elements remind us of the great gift of salvation that we've been given, but not just the reality of Christ's work on Calvary or the tomb that he ends up walking out of, but also the implications of these truths. I'm going to cover a few of them real quickly. Some specific things to remember. Jesus says here in these verses that, that he must suffer. Like he, he uses the language in a way that like he knows it's going to happen. He is aware of what, la- what lies before him. He knows how brutal the next couple of days are going to be. He knows that they will be unbearably painful. He knows that they will be unbelievably humiliating. He knows what lies before him, that he must suffer. But James tells us that even though he knows, he considers it a great joy to endure what he endures. Why? Why on earth would you find joy in knowing some of the details of what we know about the the beatings and the lashings and the excruciating pain of crucifixion that Jesus endures? Because of the great love that he has for you. We need to be reminded how deeply we are loved by God. It's not this superficial love. It's not this cheap love. It's not this, well, I'm going to love you, I'm going to love you not. It loves me, loves me not. It is a deep, abiding love. He loved you so much that he goes to the cross, that he takes your place, and he rises from the grave so that life and life eternal can be found. Something else to remember This one gets me, man. Something else to remember is that Jesus is seated with his disciples as he he partakes in Passover. And he references the fact that he is 100% aware that somebody at the table is betraying him. And he knows who it is. He's God. He knows that Judas is about to, to turn him over for some chump change. He also knows that Peter is about to deny him three times in the next 24 hours. He also knows that Thomas, upon seeing the resurrected Jesus, is still going to doubt if that's actually the resurrected Jesus. He knows that when he called Matthew out of being a tax collector, that there's an unknown amount of money that Matthew had robbed people out of. He knows. He knows all of them. And I don't mean all of them just like he knows their names and birthdays. Like he knows all of them, all of that could have been known about these individuals around the table. He's completely aware. He knows their deepest fears, their dark, darkest thoughts, their insecurities, their inconsistencies. He knew what sin they had committed and what sins they will commit. He knew them all. And he knows all of us. He knows all of us, not just names and birthdays. He knows everything about you, your deepest fears, your darkest thoughts, your insecurities, your inconsistencies, all of the things that you wouldn't want anybody else in this room knowing. He knows. There are no secrets from the suffering servant and exalted Savior. All the sin you have committed, all the sin you will ever commit, he knows it all. Remember that he knows you. 
and he still goes to the cross. Like your stuff, my stuff, like whatever it is, it isn't so bad that Jesus goes, I can't do that for them. He sees all of it, all the mess, all the junk, all the stuff that we like want to hide and want to act like it's not there, all the stuff that we can keep from like most folks in here, we can put a smile on and walk in the door and be just fine and like be dying on the inside. He sees all of it. And he still lays his life down for you and for me. Amen. This morning as we take, we take some time to remember this great work, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what Christ has done for us. Scripture does give us some parameters as for the, the who we can observe and the how we are to observe. Before we get going, if, we, if you came in this morning and you did not receive the elements of communion. Would you please lift your hand? We've got some folks that are going to be um, taking care. We're we'll, we'll bringing some things to you. The first, like I said, the, the, the who and the how, the first being the who, and that is that the observance of communion is to be reserved for only those of us who have repented of our sins and placed our faith, hope, and trust in Christ. And if you are with us today and you are not a believer in Jesus, like I, I am not playing when I say, like, I mean this. Like, I'm really glad you're here. My hope is that God is using this right now to draw you out of your bondage, to draw you into a closer relationship with him. And before you leave, if you want to talk to somebody about what it means to follow Jesus, to, to surrender your life to Jesus, to live for Christ, we're going to have a song here in just a minute. I'll be down front. Pastor Luke will be down here front with us. We would love to talk with you about it. But we ask that you abstain from taking in communion because this is a practice and observance for the family of God. We then go into the how. Like, how do we do it? How do we observe communion together as a church family? And what I mean by this is we follow the commands that we find Paul give us in 1 Corinthians 11. His instruction is that we take it in a manner that is, we do not take it in a manner that is unworthy which means we've got to do a little bit of self-reflection, a little bit of self-examination. We've got to take a moment or two and consider, like, are there things that are going on in my life that I have not laid before the Lord? Are there areas where I'm, I'm fighting against, and I'm losing the fight, but I, I don't want to let anybody know. I definitely don't want to let Jesus know. Are there sins that we have committed that we have not confessed and repented of? And that if there are, that we take a few moments before we partake as a church family to lay those things down before the Lord. So I want to invite you right here, right where you are, to take a moment to examine yourself, to pray to your Heavenly Father, to thank God for the sacrifice that Christ has made for you, both in his, both the act of death, burial, and resurrection, and the implications of those things in your life as he has drawn you out of your sin and your bondage to draw you closer to him. So let's take a few moments. Let's do just that. Jesus, we thank you. 
Amen. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much. Lord, we are hopeless without you. And Father, it is out of your great love for us that you sent Christ to endure the cross, to die in our place. And to gloriously rise from the grave. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us as we so easily move past how great and how marvelous and how significant and how absolutely amazing the truth of salvation is. Lord, I pray with with such gratitude for the hope that we have in Jesus. That it's not shallow hope, it's not cheap hope, it's not fleeting hope. It is hope that has a name. Lord, I pray that as we worship you in song this morning, that we can worship the name of Jesus uninhibited. Father, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for the gift of this church, affording us the opportunity to gather together today and worship you. Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.